Hello and welcome to lecture number seven. Today we'll explore the origins of the United States Constitution. We'll begin with a discussion of the first Constitution of the United States and then trace the steps which led Americans to adopt another Constitution to provide vision for the nation. There are several themes to be included in this lecture. First, we'll explore some of the accomplishments and shortcomings of the first Constitution. Secondly, we'll study several events associated with the Constitutional Convention held in Philadelphia in 1787. Finally, the lecture will investigate the system of separation of powers and checks and balances, which is built into our Constitution to protect the freedoms and liberties of the American people. We'll address the Articles of Confederation and the status of American territory as a result of the treaty which ended the Revolutionary War first. This map identifies the original 13 states and territories at the end of the American Revolution. Notice American territory does not simply end with the states along the Atlantic seaboard. American sovereignty extended all the way to the Mississippi River. The reason why the territory of the United States extended this far was due to the provisions of the treaty which ended the Revolutionary War. These provisions proved to be generous for the new nation. The American negotiations were led by Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, and John Jay. They faced the difficult task of trying to protect American interests while maintaining their alliance with the French. Franklin was very popular in Parisian society as he played the role of a simple American. He strolled in public wearing a fur cap and homespun clothing. He was very adept at playing the game of diplomacy, and most would argue the American did quite well in Paris. There are three primary provisions of the treaty which can be addressed here. First of all, the British agreed to formally recognize the independence of the United States. Secondly, American territory extended north of Florida to the Mississippi River and Great Lakes. There would be future disputes with Spain over Florida, as well as the British occupation of posts in the Great Lakes, but overall, these were generous boundaries. Finally, the Americans also secured valuable fishing rights off the coast of Canada's Newfoundland, as shown with the arrow on this map. There were at least two major losers with the Peace of Paris. First, loyalists still remaining in the United States were not protected. While the treaty stated loyalists were not to be persecuted, there was no requirement that confiscated properties would be returned. Native Americans were not even mentioned in the document. As noted in the previous lecture, while a majority of Native Americans fought against the Americans during the war, others fought with the colonists, as shown with this sketch. Most opposed the Americans because they held the belief that the British would prevent American expansion westward. Now, let's explore some of the accomplishments associated with the Articles of Confederation. The Articles of Confederation is the name given to the first Constitution of the United States. It had several interesting provisions. First, it established a national legislature empowered to pass laws. There was no executive nor judicial branch. Secondly, in order to pass major pieces of legislation, the support for the proposals had to be unanimous. Finally, the national government did not have the power to tax. The key philosophy which governed the Articles was its emphasis on states' rights, while the national government was weak. While there were some shortcomings to this document, it also had many successes. The first of these was the Ordinance of 1785. The Ordinance of 1785 dealt with land included what was then called the Northwest Territory. The Northwest Territory is shown here on this map. It encompassed what are now the states of Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, Wisconsin, and part of Minnesota. The arrow is pointing to Michigan. This law was important because it established a system for dividing and selling public lands. It had several important provisions. First, it required that public land must be surveyed and divided into townships six miles square. Secondly, each township would be subdivided into sections. Each section was 640 acres or one square mile. So here we are back at that map of the Northwest Territory. Additionally, on the right, you see a close-up of one region in Ohio, which was surveyed under the provisions of the ordinance. As you can see, the land is divided into nice square townships. The townships are then further divided into 36 sections. 
Each section is 640 acres or one square mile. The diagram also shows how sections were often cut in half to include smaller parcels of land. Each section of land could be bought at public auction for $1 an acre for a total of $640. Revenue taken from the sale of one section of land was to be reserved for public education. The goal of this legislation was clear. They wanted to generate money. With the national government under the Articles lacking the ability to establish taxes, it was hoped the sale of lands out west would help raise money and pay off the national debt. While the legislation was not as successful as its authors hoped at generating revenue, the ordinance was important. First, it established the precedent by which public land would be surveyed and sold. Secondly, it had an interesting impact on the landscape of the nation by establishing a grid network on the land which remains clearly remarkable today. If you've ever flown in a plane and looked down at the countryside, you see a checkerboard of structured rectangular patterns. The legacy of this so-called checkerboard layout, for good or ill, is the Ordinance of 1785. Here we see an example of this checkerboard pattern. Uh, I took this myself once when flying over some part of the country, not sure where. If we think of local townships where the college is located in Mason as well as Manistee County, you can see that different townships have different names. The college is located in Victory Township. I happen to live in Mason County's Hamlin Township. You can see some other townships as identified in these close-up maps. Another successful land ordinance passed under the Articles was the Northwest Ordinance. This was important because it created the system whereby new states could be added to the Union. First, once a state contained 5,000 voters, in this case white males, it could receive one non-voting member of Congress. Secondly, when a territory's total population reached 60,000, it could adopt a constitution and apply for statehood, which would put them on equal footing with other states. Once again, we're back to that map of the Old Northwest. Each of the states included in the Northwest Territory, as shown with the overview on the left, followed this path to statehood. Additional regulations were also included in the Northwest Ordinance. There were protections of civil liberties, such as freedom of religion and the right to a trial by jury for those living in the territories. Another provision outlawed slavery in the Northwest Territory. Taken together, the Northwest Ordinance was probably the most important accomplishment of the Articles, and its legacy has been long-lasting. Just a side note, before the passage of the ordinances, Thomas Jefferson, a member of the National Legislature from Virginia, proposed the creation of 14 new states out of the lands out west, divided on a rigid grid pattern, one of which would be named Metropotamia. The Jefferson-Hartley map on the right shows an original sketch of this plan. While the articles had some accomplishments, there were clearly some problems associated with the document. We'll investigate some of the shortcomings next. Now, I showed this slide earlier. This is just as a bit of review. The articles had some unique provisions. However, a closer inspection of these and other provisions can also help to highlight some of the problems with this document. For legislation to pass, support had to be unanimous. Each state had one vote, regardless of its size or population. This system proved troublesome to representatives from some states. The concept behind the Articles was that each state should be equal in power. So that meant that the largest state, Virginia, with a population of about 750 inhabitants, was on equal footing with the smallest state, Delaware, with its population of only 60,000. Delegates from Virginia didn't think that this was fair. In addition to these problems, each state had a tremendous range of power and authority. States could negotiate treaties, coin their own money, and even declare war. Theoretically, one state could be negotiating a trade deal with a nation, while a different state might be ready to wage war against that same nation. Now, I don't know anyone who likes to pay taxes. However, taxes fund a range of things. 
One of the problems that George Washington had during the American Revolution was a lack of money, and the supplies that he needed for his soldiers and their pay was always running short. On the left, we see an image of George Washington at Valley Forge. On the right, we see an example of one state's currency. Could you imagine going from one state to another and having to change your money? Heck, even Europe has the euro today. It was as if we had 13 separate countries as opposed to one United States of America. Problems with the articles came to the forefront with an event called Shays' Rebellion. This was a rebellion which involved many farmers living in western Massachusetts. Many found themselves in debtors' prisons and their mortgages foreclosed as they had problems paying the taxes on their land. Shays, a veteran of the Revolutionary War, got together a, an army of about 2,000 angry men who shut down the courts, thereby preventing any further foreclosures of their property. Eventually, Shays and his supporters were routed, but they highlighted the fact that the national government under the Articles was far too weak. Because of the problems, a meeting was held to fix the Articles of Confederation. The name of the important meeting, which was called to fix the problems with the Articles of Confederation, was the Constitutional Convention. We'll provide some background information about several of the individuals who attended this set of meetings. First of all, do you know where these delegates met? Well, they met in the city of brotherly love, Philadelphia, at what's now called Independence Hall. I hope you enjoy the photo. There were 55 delegates who attended meetings at the Constitutional Convention. Some have argued that this, is, this was the greatest collection of minds under one roof in all of American history. Because so many attended these meetings, it would be impossible to identify all of them. However, we'll highlight a few of the important participants. Probably the most famous American among the American people is shown here. George Washington. He was the head of the Continental Army during the Revolutionary War that defeated the mighty British Empire. One of the first decisions made by the delegates to the convention was to have Washington preside over their meetings each day as chair. The oldest delegate to the Constitutional Convention was over 80 years old. It was Ben Franklin. During the war, he had served as a diplomat and successfully was able to get the French to fight on behalf of the colonies. On the right, we see someone else. He was only 36 years old and is somewhat underrated as a political figure. His name was James Madison, a Virginia politician. If there were only 55 delegates, all of whom were white men, at the Constitutional Convention, there were plenty of people who were not there. However, I did want to point out one. He's shown here. Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson wasn't even in the country during the Constitutional Convention. Overall, one individual is generally identified as the so-called father of the Constitution. That person is none other than James Madison. His actions at the convention will be discussed soon, but what we'll see is that he had a great political mind and was a master of the political process. One approach for studying the provisions of the Constitution are best described as focusing on a series of controversies resolved through compromise reached at the Constitutional Convention. The first such controversy dealt with representation for each state in Congress. The first controversy was caused by James Madison as he developed the Virginia Plan. His plan had a few main points. First, it called for the complete elimination of the Articles of Confederation. This was a radical proposal as the delegates were only supposed to modify the Articles. However, after some initial discussion, delegates agreed that they needed to start from scratch. A second provision called for the division of the national government's power into three separate branches. He argued there should be a national legislature, executive, and judicial branch. Hopefully this chart can provide a visual aid demonstrating the ideas of his plan. Madison argued that in order to protect individual liberties, the government's power should be divided. There should be a specific set of jobs or duties for the legislature, another for the chief executive, 
and an, an additional set of responsibilities for the judiciary. In Madison's eyes, the legislative branch would be the most powerful of the three. The third provision I'd like to mention caused a major problem as Madison proposed that representation for each state in the national legislature should be determined entirely by a state's population. Well, we're back again to that visual aid. Delegates from the large states thought the ideas in the Virginia plan were great. This would allow them to have more power and influence. However, delegates from the small states were upset. They would stand to lose power under this proposed system. Some even threatened to leave the convention itself. The success of the Constitutional Convention was very much threatened. It was actually up to the oldest delegate at the convention, Benjamin Franklin, who, once cooler heads prevailed, was able to get both sides to agree to a compromise. This compromise, named the Great Compromise, accepted much of those provisions of the Virginia Plan, but when it came to determining the number of representatives, well, in that legislative branch, well, Franklin argued that the legislative branch should be divided into two units. One chamber would be the Senate, and each state would have two members of the Senate. Another chamber would be the House. The number of House members would be determined by each state's population. Again, here we are back at that visual aid. The compromise suggested that the legislative branch should be divided into two chambers, the House and the Senate. However, representation for the states in each would be a bit different. Delegates from the large states were happy with the House of Representatives because the number of House members for each state would be determined entirely by each state's population. The smaller states were reassured by the makeup of the Senate because each state would be treated equally two senators for each state. So in any compromise, you might get a little, but you might have to give up a little. And that's what happened in this case. The next controversy dealt with the issue of slavery and how slaves would be counted when determining each state's population. As the Constitutional Convention continued, a question was raised. Should states be allowed to count slaves when determining their populations? Delegates from states with large numbers of slaves argued yes, while delegates from other states were opposed. Here's that map of the original states and territories. Slavery existed in every single English colony before the American Revolution. There were more prevalent in southern states where they played a crucial role in the region's economy. However, they were less common further north. During the era of the revolution, as people spoke of equality and liberty in some states, like Massachusetts, among others, began to legally phase out the institution of slavery. This visual aid offers a bit more detail. It shows the number of African Americans as a percentage of each state's population in 1790 when the first census was taken. Notice for over 40% of the residents of South Carolina and Virginia were African Americans. Overwhelmingly, they were enslaved. This controversy over counting slaves threatened to end the convention in failure. In what would foreshadow future conflicts facing the nation, this one was largely seen along regional lines, north versus south. Eventually, however, an agreement was reached. 55 of the so-called greatest minds came up with what has come to be known as the three-fifths compromise. Essentially, it declared that one slave was equal to three-fifths of a person when determining each state's population. The issue of slavery was important, and it did appear in association with two additional issues at the convention. First, a fugitive slave law was included, which required states to allow for the return of runaway slaves. Secondly, the Constitution prohibited Congress from outlawing the slave trade until 1808. The words slave nor slavery appear in the Constitution as the delegates were clearly embarrassed by supporting the institution of slavery. However, as the provisions show, the framers of the Constitution clearly had limited views of what was meant by the words equality and freedom. At the end of a very hot summer, by September of 1787, the delegates were able to come to agreement on the final provisions of the new constitution. The group is portrayed here as a gathering of demigods in this famous painting by Thomas Pritchard Rossiter.
One of the important concepts included in the Constitution is the idea of separation of powers and checks and balances. These are designed to protect the people's freedom and liberty. We'll now look more closely at these provisions. The way I'd like to approach this topic is to fill in the different aspects of this chart. First, we'll discuss who is included in the three branches, then we'll identify the job of each, and finally the lecture will explore five separate checks. These are ways in which the different branches check or stop the actions of the other in hopes of protecting people's freedom and liberty. So I do periodically like to provide a visual aid. What we see here would be the separation of powers uh, included into the three branches of government. The legislative branch or Congress meets in the United States Capitol. The president lives and works in the White House. And on the bottom, we see the United States Supreme Court building, which, is, which houses our judiciary. So now we're back to that chart. The executive branch includes the president and members of the president's administrative staff. The legislative branch includes the House and Senate, or Congress, and the judiciary includes the federal courts and the highest court in the land, the Supreme Court. Each branch has an important job. It's the job of the executive branch to enforce laws. At times, people get confused as to the president's actual role, but here we see President Obama as well as President Bush. They're the ones who enforce laws that are passed by Congress. They do so by providing direction to organizations like the Drug Enforcement Agency or the um, Immigration and Customs Enforcement Services. It's the job of the legislative branch to write laws. This photo identifies the United States Capitol. On the left, we see the chamber where the House of Representatives operates. And on the right is where the Senate is located. Our judiciary has the job of interpreting laws to let us know what they actually mean. This photo identifies the nine members of the United States Supreme Court today. In the center, we see the Chief Justice, John Roberts. Now, one way that the executive branch can check or influence the actions of the judiciary is that if there's a vacancy on one of the courts, the president has the sole power to nominate someone to fill one of those vacancies. Here we see some recent nominees for Presidents Obama, Trump, and Biden. President Obama was able to name two people to the Supreme Court. President Trump was able to name three. And while she hasn't taken her position yet as of June of 2022, Ketanji Brown Jackson was nominated by President Biden and she will take over once the court resumes in October. While the president has the sole authority to nominate someone to fill a vacancy, the Senate has the ability to either confirm or reject any of those judicial nominations. This is one way that the legislative branch can check both the executive as well as judicial branches. The judiciary can also check the actions of both the legislative branch and executive. For example, the judiciary can declare presidential actions to be unconstitutional. I'd like to offer a couple of examples here. In the 1970s, during the Watergate scandal, it was learned that President Nixon had a taping system at the White House, yet he refused to give up those tapes. In a unanimous decision, the United States Supreme Court ordered the president to hand over or release those tapes. More recently, we see some examples with the Trump administration. When Donald Trump ran for president, he talked about having a Muslim ban on people entering the United States from predominantly Muslim countries. One of those bans was um, uh, put into place by the president and it was struck down by the courts. He revised it and um, issued another one and that was struck down by the Supreme Court. They modified it one final time uh, and eventually a modified version of that so-called Muslim travel ban was allowed to remain in place by our courts. 
Here is another set of checks. First, the president has the ability to propose legislation. When people run for the presidency, they often come up with slogans or they champion a set of ideas. In the upper left, we see Franklin Roosevelt, who promised the American people a new deal. In the bottom left, we see President Bush, who campaigned on the promise of a tax cut. In the upper right, we see President Obama talking about a national health care plan, and President Trump campaigned on the need for a border wall on the U.S. border with Mexico. While presidents can propose laws and ask Congress to pass legislation, they have no authority at all to pass laws. That's entirely within the purview of the legislative branch. Once a bill becomes a law, if someone files a lawsuit, the judiciary can also step in and declare laws to be unconstitutional. It's up to those nine members of the Supreme Court that have the final say to determine the interpretation of a law. Does it violate the Constitution? If so, that law can be struck down. Back in 1989, the Supreme Court struck down laws in several states and the federal government um, that uh, made it a felony to burn an American flag. Today, and since 1989, burning an American flag is a protected form of free speech. I'd like to address some additional checks now. If Congress passes legislation that the president doesn't support, the president has the authority to veto those bills. However, the legislative branch has the final say because the House and the Senate have the ability to override a presidential veto. I'd like to explain how that would work. Essentially, in order for a bill to become a law, it has to pass by a simple majority. However, if the president vetoes a bill, a two-thirds majority vote in the House and the Senate would override that presidential veto, and therefore a bill can become a law even without the president's approval or signature. When it comes to the military, the president is commander-in-chief of our armed forces. Here we see a couple of examples of the president acting as commander-in-chief. In the upper left, we see President Obama in the Situation Room approving the raid on Osama bin Laden. In the bottom right, we see President Trump addressing troops on an aircraft carrier. While the president is commander-in-chief of the armed forces, only Congress has the authority to declare war. Here we see Franklin Roosevelt in December of 1941 addressing Congress and asking them to declare war following the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor the previous day. On the left, we see a copy of his speech. There have been conflicts between presidents and Congress in the past when it comes to actually waging war. The United States has only declared war five times in its history. Can you name them? It begins with the War of 1812, then the Mexican War in the 1840s, the Spanish-American War in the 1890s, and then World War I and World War II. The last time the United States declared war was in the 1940s. If the president or a member of the judiciary commits a high crime or a misdemeanor or commits treason, the legislative branch has the authority to impeach and even remove them from office. If the president is the one who's been impeached, the Constitution tells us that the Chief Justice presides over any presidential impeachment trial. A two-step process is needed in order to remove the president or a member of the judiciary from office. The first of those steps is impeachment. This would 
allow for the bringing of official charges against someone. The House of Representatives has the sole power to impeach, and it requires a simple majority vote. An impeachment is similar to an indictment. Essentially, what this means is if someone is indicted for a crime, this means they're officially charged with that crime. The government is saying, we think you have committed a particular crime. If you or I were accused of a crime, we would have a trial. The same would be true if the president was impeached. There would be a trial. It would take place in the Senate. At the end of that trial, the Senate would act as a jury. A two-thirds majority vote is needed to remove the president or a member of the judiciary from office. The three presidents shown here are the only presidents who have ever been impeached. Andrew Johnson back in the 1800s, Bill Clinton in the late 1990s, and Donald Trump. All three were impeached. However, there were not enough votes for any of them to be removed. Most recently, President Trump was impeached, actually twice the only president to be impeached twice, once in 2019 and once again in 2021. On the left, we see an image of Mitch McConnell, who was the leader of the Senate when President Trump had his impeachment trial. Senate rules do require that if a president has been impeached, then there must be a trial. Uh, it's kind of interesting, though, because uh, senators are required to remain silent throughout the entire trial. For example, they're not allowed to have their cell phones. The, during the mornings, the Senate would conduct its regular business. But then, beginning at 1 o'clock, that's when the trial would begin. And if necessary, it would go six days a week. The result of President Trump's first trial uh, was that he was not guilty. The results uh, were decided almost exclusively along party lines, with the Democrats declaring that the president was guilty and Republicans saying that he was not guilty. Um, on the first charge of obstruction of justice, 53 senators said not guilty, 47 said guilty, and on the second charge, abuse of power, it was 52 senators saying guilty. There was uh, one senator, one Republican senator, I should say, who voted uh, to determine that President Trump was guilty of a abuse of power, and that was Mitt Romney. However, um, President Trump was impeached, but he was not found guilty. Following the insurrection in January of 2021, President Trump was again impeached by the House of Representatives. In this case, it was for the incitement of the insurrection. There was more of a bipartisan vote in this particular case, with more Republicans voting to um, determine that the president was guilty. However, once again, overall, President Trump was impeached, but he was not found guilty because in order to remove the president from office, a two-thirds majority vote was needed. There were 57 senators who voted guilty and seven of the Republicans actually voted with the Democrats to, um, as they believed that he was guilty. However, it's important to note President Trump was impeached, but he was not removed because there was no two-thirds majority that's necessary in order to remove him from office. Well, the impeachment process is complicated, but hopefully this helps to explain some of the processes involved. Um, if not, uh, maybe we can have some extended discussion on the forum posts uh, on Canvas. Due to the compromises accepted by a majority of the delegates by September of 1787, the new constitution was ready to be sent to the states for ratification. It would not go into effect until at least nine states held special conventions during which the provisions of the document would be discussed and then, ideally, approved. This turned out to be quite a fight as some groups were opposed to the agreements that were reached. Supporters of the new constitution came to be known as Federalists. They were supporters of a strong national government. Opponents of the constitution, many of whom were small farmers, earned the label Anti-Federalists. Their opposition centered around concerns that a strong central government could pose a threat to individual liberties. After considerable discussion and debate, when New Hampshire approved the Constitution in June of 1788, the requirement of nine states had been secured. Soon thereafter, the key states of Virginia and New York ratified the Constitution. 
there was considerable celebration in New York, which was captured in this painting by an unknown artist, demonstrating the jubilant mood of many. This lecture has contained many important ideas. Let's review some of them next. Well, this lecture has addressed a range of topics. First, some of the accomplishments and failures of the Articles of Confederation were investigated. The lecture also described some of the primary provisions of the U.S. Constitution. Maybe there are two things that can be considered as you leave this subject. First, you should be able to compare and contrast the similarities and differences of each of these documents. If you were given the chance to develop a new constitution with provisions, what would you include and why? Secondly, you should be able to describe and evaluate the system of separation of powers and checks and balances. Overall, do you believe it successfully protects your freedom and liberty? Well, this concludes lecture number seven. Take care and I hope the information has given you something to think about. The next few slides will include sources for additional information and some of the sources used to create this presentation. Have a great day.